Hello, hola, bonjour. First of all, thank you for being here. My name is Sohan Maheshwar, and I'm here to talk to you about architecting for sustainability in the cloud. I work at AWS, or Amazon Web Services, as a developer advocate, and I work with devs and customers on their cloud journey. So today is as good a time as any time to talk about sustainability, because scientists are saying that, oh, first, scientists need to fix my pointer. But scientists are saying that we don't have too much time to limit the damage that uh, the climate crisis has already caused. And by 2050, if we work now, we have a chance to make headway and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, the thing is, tech and technology is at the heart of everything that we do. So as folks working in technology such as you and me, we really have a chance to make a difference. Sustainability is it's not an on-off switch, right? It really is a journey. And that journey begins by understanding first what your carbon footprint really is. As people working in tech or in the cloud, we all also have a carbon footprint. And once you recognize that and understand what that carbon footprint is, really you can look at architecting for sustainability and how you can reduce your carbon impact. And then, of course, we have sustainability transformation, which is similar to the idea of digital transformation, but you're transforming the processes and your technology for sustainability. Apart from the small thing of saving the climate and saving the environment, it's also good for business. So if you're in a business or if you're in a technology partner, as Accenture said in the study from last year, the digital intersection of technology and transformation, uh, of sustainability transformation, will actually give business growth of up to 2.5x. So really, if you're looking forward as a business, sustainability is a key trend that you should really be looking at. Now, if you've already moved from a data center to the cloud, congratulations, you've already done step one, because studies have shown that data centers aren't as sustainable as working in the cloud. And this is because the cloud uses a shared resource model. And just by using that and not something that is meant only for you, you are already improving on your carbon impact. OK, uh, has any folks or anyone here works on AWS? I'm on web service, few of you all. So you all might be familiar with this thing that we call the shared responsibility model in AWS. Now, this typically holds good for security and compliance, where the security and compliance of the cloud is taken care of by AWS, but security and compliance in the cloud is taken care of by you, the customer. Right? And we give you all the options and customizations to make that possible. So we are really looking at sustainability in the exact same way, where the sustainability in the cloud is the customer's responsibility. So everything from data design and usage, software application design, storage, code efficiency, all of that is up to you, the customer, whereas AWS takes care of the sustainability of the cloud itself. So things like cooling, water stewardship, energy used, um, and just the other infrastructure is taken care of by AWS. Today, I'm going to talk about how you as a customer can be responsible or improve the sustainability in the cloud. Right? And that's what we're going to do a deep dive on. But first, just one slide about what AWS is doing for sustainability of the cloud. AWS is committed to making sure that all the infrastructure we use in our data centers is indeed uh, as sustainable as possible. So this means things like water stewardship. You know, we're trying to use as much uh, recycled and local water. We're using renewable sources of energy to power these data centers. Uh, we're using customized hardware to improve performance. And we have things like the ASDI, or the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. This, these are data sets and models that you can use 
to actually build really cool things in the climate and sustainability space. So if you're looking on a cool data set to use for something in this region, just look up ASDI, and it's available free of cost for anyone to build. So this was the sustainability of the cloud, but we are here to talk about how you can actually do sustainability in the cloud. And to define that, we define it as a continuous focused effort on reducing energy and efficiency across the components of your workload. I think for me, the key here is the continuous focused effort. Because like everything we do, right? like the DevOps that we do, or like the testing we do, it's not a one-time thing. It is something that you have to continuously look at and look at improving and making more efficient to really reduce your carbon footprint. Right? And let's discuss how to do this via these six things today. So today we're going to talk about everything from selecting a region and how that can impact your carbon impact to things like how you can make your data storage more efficient and also across your entire dev and deployment process. So let's start with region selection. Now, a few of you all might know that AWS has regions, like US East 1 and EU West 1. Regions are basically geographical locations where there are a cluster of data centers. And within these 26 regions that exist today, there are 84 availability zones, which are clusters of data centers isolated from one another. The interesting thing is that there are actually 310 renewable energy projects across the world within AWS, which includes about 88 in our part of the world. So as you can see, depending on your business requirement you know, and your sustainability goals, you can choose a region which could reduce your carbon impact. Of course, you might have something like a data sovereignty requirement which means that the data has to be in a certain country or region. Right? But at the same time, you might not have a requirement like that where you can choose a region which could lower your carbon impact. For instance, just by choosing a region, you can have different sustainability goals. So in Europe and APAC, a region is about five times more energy efficient, uh, whereas in the US, it's about 3.6 times more energy efficient. You might think, uh, why this disparity? Well, that actually comes to how energy is calculated, right? How is this efficiency actually calculated? To understand that, there are three things you need to know in terms of the terminology. How you calculate energy consumed is in terms of scope one, which is energy consumed at a source. So in your car, if you're burning some fuel, that is scope one energy. There's scope two, which is basically electricity that is consumed and calculated once. So say you're using electricity to power something at your home, that is scope two. And scope three is basically everything else, right? For your supply chain, whatever. A typical data center has a mix of scope one, two, and three. Right? You have scope two, so you might have some renewable energy from winds that are powering your data center, so that's scope two. You might have scope three, which is the energy used in the construction of the building itself. And you might have scope one, which is few backup generators, which is consuming fuel. Now, these things, of course, cost and are different in different parts of the world. And hence, in the US versus in Europe, you might have different energy efficiency in how you use it. So just by choosing a region, you can actually reduce your carbon impact. Let's talk about user behavior patterns, right? And essentially, you want to talk about where, how, and why your users are actually using your product and what you can do to improve it. I'll give you a small example, right? And it all comes down to what your service level agreements, or SLAs, are with your customer. So say we have an SLA for immediate failover, which means that if something happens, you don't want to impact your users because it's mission critical and you want to start something immediately. If you want to optimize your capacity, right? if you want to optimize your capacity for sustainability, we've seen our customers do something like this, where they have 50% of their workload in availability zone A, and 50% of their workload in availability zone B. 
Unfortunately, with this, you're not utilizing both availability zone A or B well enough. 50% of both is unused, which means your costs are going up, and so is your carbon impact. Now, suppose in the small case that something goes wrong with availability zone A, you know? What happens is you have to transfer that workload to availability zone B, in which case, yeah, you have, you have done well on your SLA, there is immediate failover, but your capacity planning hasn't been great. What you can do instead is actually run it in three availability zones, right? Where each of them are running up to two-third utilization. So this way your capacity planning is better because there's very little unused capacity in each. And if something goes wrong in availability zone A, you can just switch it to availability zone B and C. Right? So that way your capacity, you're optimizing for that, and you still have your immediate failover if something goes wrong. Now say that your SLA is about non-immediate failover. Right? It's not mission critical, and users, well, it's, it's, a, it's a workload that can actually take some time to come back up. So in this case, you can actually use cold capacity. Right? So you use full utilization in availability zone A, and because there's no requirement for an immediate failover, you can keep cold capacity available in AZB. So in case A goes down, you can just switch everything to AZB, it will take some time to, of course, be up and running, but, of course, you have full capacity and there is a trade-off there. So just thinking along these lines actually helps. Of course, this comes down to what your service level agreements are. So when you are going to talk to a customer and maybe that customer is keen on a sustainability trend, try and negotiate, negotiate impact-friendly SLAs. The upside to this is you probably will reduce your costs as well, or your customers' costs as well. Uh, sometimes there is a downside, which is there might be an increase in response time, but maybe your workload doesn't need it. Let's talk about software patterns, right? And how we architect our software actually can influence what our impact and what our carbon footprint is. And you might be thinking, wait, how is this possible? Well, turns out it is. Right, let's take a look. So if you look at capacity versus time, the one thing you have to realize is we always end up provisioning capacity for the peaks. We never provision capacity for an average. We always end up doing it for the peak usage. So you're like, oh, my peaks are at this point of time, so I need to provision a little more capacity in case something happens. What if I go viral and suddenly there are a bunch of people using my app or whatever, right? But with this, you can see that the average is fairly low, but you're provisioning capacity for the peak, and that's what you're being charged for, and that's what resources are being taken. So in your software, if you find a way to reduce those peaks, your provision capacity also can reduce. So again, if you reduce those peaks, you're reducing the provision capacity as well, thereby reducing your cost but also reducing your impact. Now you might ask me, how do I actually do this? I'm going to give you a few things that you can do immediately right now you know, with your software. Quick pop quiz, does anyone know what this is? Have you seen something like this? No? A few of you all might have seen it. This is a cron tab or a cron job right, uh, to run at midnight every day. And what happens, and we've seen this with customers, right? you want to run a batch processing job or some sort of cron job twice a day, everyone runs it at almost the same time. Yeah, everyone's like, eh, let me just run it at midnight. But here's the thing, with a shared resource, lots of clock synchronized workloads, they drive up these peak workloads, right? Imagine every customer out there running the same cron job at midnight. Yeah, and this is actually driving up how this shared resource is using, thereby increasing those peaks. So, all of these clock-driven peak times actually drives up the total capacity needed in the cloud. So if you can find different times to do it, it doesn't have to be a round number, this actually reduces your peaks. Another way to also do it is to look at asynchronous and scheduled jobs and maybe use queues. 
you know, this might sound counterintuitive, but I've seen it when I've sp spoken to customers and I've said, if you run some of your processes slower, it doesn't impact anything downstream, right? Right now we think, oh, I have to run everything immediately as soon as the request comes in. But if you use queues and smooth out the peaks, the overall impact and efficiency and metrics is exactly the same, right? Uh, you, you, can, you can look it up, you can study, it actually ends up working out that way. And if your workload allows it, you could also do event-driven programming using services like Lambda or EventBridge, right? So when the event actually comes through, you can use it in queues or you can use event-driven programming to smoothen out those peaks when they actually happen. All right, so let's talk about hardware patterns. Now, this is going to be a little AWS specific, but we're going to talk about different instant types, and just using the minimum that you need using certain hardware. Uh, I think the fundamental principle here is to maximize efficiency and minimize the resources that you need. The upside, of course, you reduce your costs, but also you know, you're reducing your uh, overall impact. An easy win, an easy win or an easy switch is just to switch to Graviton processors. Right? Graviton is custom built. It's an ARM-based processor. They are way more efficient, up to 60% uh, less energy consumed than a typical x86 processor. Right? And uh, there are these instances available in Graviton 2 that was launched, I think, in 2020 or maybe 2019, reInvent. And you can get started on, you can find the GitHub link here. At last year's reInvent, we also announced Graviton 3, which is in preview, which offers more cost savings and less energy used. And again, all with just choosing to run on Graviton 3. It's pretty much as simple as that. And Graviton also supports all of the AWS services that you probably use. So if you're already running containers on Amazon ECS or Amazon EKS, you can choose to run them on a Graviton processor to see this cost and energy saving. You can run your CI CD processes with the code build, code deploy suite of services. Again, works. And on some of our serverless services, like Lambda and Fargate, literally, if you're using Lambda right now, you can just check a box that says run this on a Graviton processor instead of x86. And you immediately get those cost and energy savings. Yeah? So there isn't even that much work as someone building something serverless, to shift to this. So we spoke about hardware. Let's talk data. I think data is, if I have to take a guess, data is probably the most commonly used word in all tech meetings. Right? Everyone's like, data this and data that. It turns out what is true is every company does generate a lot of data. right? And from my conversations with customers, I've realized that most of us, we just end up holding all of this data and not paying too much attention to it. Right? And we never really optimize how that data is stored or how we are also storing it and processing it. Turns out we do generate a lot of data, and that data actually, again, has a direct correlation to our energy and to our impact. So here are some things that you could do for data and optimize it. One, just classifying all the data that you generate is a good step towards doing this. So say you have data in an S3 bucket. There are ways to put data into like a deep archive, right? where you don't access it too much. Maybe you just need it for the next one year, and then you don't need it. And then eventually, you can delete the data. It's as simple as just writing a simple policy like this, where you say, transition to deep archive in 30 days, or after 3,650 days, the data can expire. Right? So after 10 years, it, you can delete the data. Most of us, we just end up leaving the data here on an S3 bucket, which we don't use as often. And so again, your costs are increasing, but also you know, your energy consumed is increasing. Really classify all the different types of data you have. There might be some data that you use very often, right? for which you can use something like S3 standard, multiple availability zones, you have millisecond access, all good. right? You need that data often, keep it there. There might be data that you use just once in a while. 
it's good to move it to S3 Glacier, for instance, where it takes between few minutes and hours to retrieve that data, it's still there, and make sure you know, data that you've almost never accessed can be in a deep archive or you can actually delete it. You might think, okay, does this actually bring about a lot of change? Well, yes, it actually does. What also brings out a lot of change is choosing the right data formats for your data. We have seen that choosing formats like Parquet or Orc, but also using purpose-built services and purpose-built data databases always end up being more energy efficient than using a standard database and suiting it for your use case. So for instance, if you're storing a lot of IoT data or time series data, you can use TimeStream, right? That's just an example. This is actually funny, so I'm sure all of us generate a lot of logs in our typical day-to-day -day work, and just optimizing on how you store these logs made such a huge difference. So uh, for an internal service, we switched from uh, our compression algorithm to Z standard, right? It's a different compression algorithm, and you won't believe the savings that we saw. Our compression ratio improved by 30% when we moved from gzip to Z standard, but also we reduced our storage by one exabyte. Does anyone know how many zeros are there in one exabyte? Any guesses? There are 18 zeros, right? It's one million terabytes, like a really, really big hard disk. So again, just by switching our compression, we were able to reduce our storage by one exabyte, right? And at scale, this makes a huge difference. So if you have a program or some workload that's generating a lot of log data, look at how these compression works and do some tests to see if you can actually optimize that. Again, saves costs, saves data storage, and also you know, reduces your impact. And lastly, we are going to talk about the dev and deployment process. Like with everything we do, it's not just about flicking a switch, right? It is about adding it into your processes and your culture. So you really need to be built to add these different sustainability processes at any point in your dev cycle, right? I'm sure you have DevOps cycles. Uh, so how do you actually add that at any point? One cool thing that we did uh, with our AWS SDK for JavaScript, you should check out this blog post. So we had an AWS SDK for JavaScript, right? Came with all the different SDKs, I mean, the AWS services in that SDK. Pretty big file, a um, lot of libraries, a lot of services. So with version three, we made it modular, right? Where if you're saying using only S3 and Lambda, you could only use those packages. And we actually got feedback from the community if this was something that you all wanted. Everyone said, Hell yes, we actually want this, this will be amazing. So we tried it out, and we managed to reduce that build artifact size by about 75%, right? This such a small change reduced the build artifact size by 75%, and after further optimizations, including some of the things that I mentioned earlier, we were able to reduce install and publish size by 50%. So just some thought to how do you reduce your build packages, gave us so much more optimization on our build files itself, right? And now this is being deployed to other workloads, which is then being more optimal. So really look at how you could do something like this with your build files. When it comes to this cycle, right, I'm sure in your projects you go from a concept to implementation, to staging, and then to production. Typically, if you're using AWS or really any other cloud provider, there is a well-architected review just before you go to production. Right? You see, am I well-architected in terms of security, cost efficiency, performance, all of those pillars? Really, with sustainability, you can do it in production, but it is expensive, so we are asking customers to do a left shift. This is a concept that we have sort of borrowed from the world of testing and DevOps, where you bring this process and this culture to every stage of this life cycle, right? So you really bring this sustainability processes into your design. You bring it into your implementation and into your staging so that in production you actually are sustainable. 
it's interesting. <laughs> Uh, how many people here have like monthly reports, weekly reports, daily stand-ups, daily scrums? Raise hand, most of you all. Okay, how many people have a sustainability metric in any of these meetings? Right? And this is the typical answer I get. We all talk about sustainability, we all make the nice big presentation about it, but really none of us are measuring it as a metric or a KPI in our business. So unless it's part of that process, no one's going to pay attention to it. I'm sure you, know, you have other requirements, and that's, I think, the most important thing in this presentation today. When you have a project, you have certain requirements, right? You have functional requirements like, what are my storage costs? What are my compute costs? What is my utilization? And sometimes these work against each other. For instance, you can say, hey, look, I am going to store data in every different region, thereby increasing my storage costs, but decreasing my data transfer costs. Or you might say, hey, I'm not going to store much data. I will just transfer data back and forth, in which case storage costs are reducing, but data transfer costs are increasing. Similarly, storage and compute can work against each other. Do you make repeated computations, or do you store data and cache it? Sustainability really is a non-functional requirement with your other non-functional requirements. Again, in your cloud, you might have response time, availability, cost, as some of the metrics that you look at in these meetings. And really, sustainability should be part of that non-functional requirement as well. And again, it can work against some of them. But again, that comes back to what I said earlier about negotiating impact-friendly SLAs with your customer. So for instance, do you do a lot of processing on your end user's device? So thereby that saves you compute costs. But is that more sustainable? Because that means every year your customer has to buy a new fancy phone. Right? So where is the impact and how these things are playing against each other? These are hard questions to answer. But really, to make a difference, we need to start talking about some of these things. And really, you'll have to look at a metric and normalize that metric. Don't just take a look at the resources used. For instance, if your resources used are being stable, but your user base is decreasing, that means you're probably doing something wrong, and you're not as efficient as you should be. Yeah? So really, you want to normalize that metric or that KPI by doing resource per unit of work. For example, you see, how many virtual CPUs am I using per connected mile of vehicle? Not just how many virtual CPUs am I using. Yeah? So once you have that normalized metric, you can actually look at this metric in your daily, weekly, monthly stand-ups and actually have it as a non-functional requirement in your project. How do you take a look at your carbon emissions? Right? This is, again, something we have probably not seen when building software. Right? We are just focused on our software. We have not looked at our carbon emissions. Uh, at least AWS provides you a customer carbon footprint tool. So it's live right now. So if you're using AWS, go to your cost explorer. Uh, you will see this tool with your emissions by different service. So you can see, OK, uh, S3 has 21 megatons of CO2 your total, you can see it per region, and you can also see a nice report of your emissions summary. So you actually get a breakdown of which service or which region is using more CO2, thereby getting a good example of you know, what your sustainability metrics are. And really speaking about KPIs and metrics, it's about telling that story, right? It's about selling this to leadership. It's about telling the story to your customers as well. So really, the mix of this cost and usage report that I spoke about with the typical metrics that you use can tell a story via, you know, if you use QuickSight Athena, where you get analytics and dashboards about things that are being used. So you can easily create a nice dashboard about how you've lowered your carbon footprint over six months or over a year by architecting for sustainability. And like I said, this is a business driver for your business. Just as a quick recap, I think it's up to each of us in our roles to own 
part of this, right? It's not just someone at the top doing it, or it's not just that one junior dev who's like sustainability dev engineer. It's all of us, right? So as someone in DevOps or as someone as an architect, really you want to optimize for efficiency or architect for sustainability. But higher at the top, you want to report some of these things to leadership and to your customers as well, that you're actually making a difference and you're also taking a look at this. Just as a quick side note, AWS has a well-architected framework where we have these pillars, and we recently introduced a sustainability pillar. Right? So every company that works with AWS uses this well-architected review. You answer a bunch of questions to see if you're being optimal on these pillars, and the product gives you certain tips and tricks and best practices to make sure you are actually well-architected. And in reInvent last year, we announced the sustainability pillar as well. Uh, you will be seeing many updates to this in the coming months, I am sure, because this is new, but it is evolving. But if you're using AWS Well Architected Review, make sure to check out the sustainability pillar as well. As a summary, that is us right now. So really understand that this is a journey. There is certain terminology, like I said, you know, scope one, scope two, scope three, and the different metrics, all of that. And really start identifying and realizing that there is a carbon footprint to what we can do, but we can do things better to reduce that carbon footprint. You can do that by all of these best practices that I spoke about today. Uh, also check out the well-architected review for more of these best practices. And at the same time, it's important to have KPIs and metrics uh, for your workload and really talk about them a lot more. Maybe about 10 years ago, the term digital transformation started becoming popular, right? And we're still talking about it. Has anyone heard or done that in their meetings? A lot of you all, yeah. Uh, it's the talk of town still, and that took a few years, right? Digital transformation in a company took a few years. Sustainability transformation is going to take a much longer time, right? And it, the time we start is really now. Like I said, there is a small thing of saving the environment, but also driving your business because this is a new trend and customers are keen to work with companies that you know, have this as a, a key objective. So the reason I'm talking to you about this here is I think here in the Benelux, we come from a culture of sustainability. Right? I live in Amsterdam, a lot of windmills around. I took that photo a couple of weeks ago. Maybe not the best example because that is actually a beer brewery, but I thought, hey, it's a windmill, so it'll fit. Uh, but we come from a culture of sustainability here. Right? We've been harnessing the wind for the longest time. Uh, we've been riding our bikes. So really, it's up to people like you and me to start having this conversation and make a difference. And the reason is, it's, well, it's not a great scene out there. We have 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide out as emissions when it comes to greenhouse gases. And this, well, it's less than ideal. If you see information and uh, communications tech, it's actually not that big in this whole thing. Right? It's, it's, uh, there's a high and a low estimate for it. But, like I said, tech is at the heart of everything that we do today, literally, right? So really, it's up to us to think beyond just tech and see how you can make a change in the world today with tech and with sustainability. So as a call to action, uh, the easiest thing is just to talk about it. You know, talk about it in your team, in your company, at meetups, online. Uh, start realizing that there are things that we can all do to actually make a small difference, right? However small it is, we all can do, can indeed uh, make a difference. And start reading about it. There is so much info available online, both on the environmental aspect and on the technological aspect. And given that this is something we're all talking about now, I think you'll find a lot more content and information out there about this very soon. Anyway, that's almost up for my time. Uh, please do connect with me online, offline, whatever. Uh, quick shout out to a couple of talks. My colleague Sebastian is talking later today on OAuth. He's an expert, so if you want to understand security, uh, check out that talk. And tomorrow at 4 o'clock, our friends at Econo are going to be talking about cloud. There's a bit about sustainability and what they did in their company as well. So do check it out. 
Anyway, thank you so much. I have about five minutes for questions. So if you have questions, you can shout it out, uh, or we can meet offline. Yes, question. Yeah. So, so the question for the benefit of the audience was, is it a good rule of thumb if you don't have info about how your carbon emissions are, that if you save resources, you will, be, you will reduce your impact? That is it, right? Or if you, yeah. Uh, I would say yes, in the sense that the more optimal you use your resources or the lesser resources you use for the same thing, you are reducing your impact right there and you're reducing your cost as well. So if you don't have an exact metric about your carbon emissions, then you know, cost might be a good way of looking at it as well. Yeah. OK, anyone else has any questions? Anyone? OK, I'll be around for a while. So if anyone wants to speak to me about AWS, cloud, sustainability, well, feel free to do so. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, folks, and thanks for having me. Thank you.